here with my grandmother, Dorothy Ann Dixon, on July 27, 2003 at her childhood home at 2212 Tremont Avenue in Fort Worth, Texas. And I will be interviewing my grandmother today along with her older brother, William Paddock, who you will meet shortly. My name is William I. Paddock. The name of this song is I Saw the Light. I used to sing it when I was a kid, but I didn't know what it meant until I got older and was born again. Now I understand what it means. And so I finally 
quit and let her come out. <laughs> Didn't you catch something on fire when you were burning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Uncle Blair, let's hear about that. Well, I was just a little kid and I was playing out in this vacant lot behind our house there. Kind of had corners over there. And, uh, somehow that grass caught on fire. I think I must have been playing with some matches or something. Mm -hmm. And so I ran home, and ran inside, and and, and I was, pretty soon my said, uh, "There's a man at the door who wants to see you. If you want to know if you know anything about fire starting over there." <laughs> <laughs> so I hid under the bed and got way back under. <laughs> oh my gosh! So did you get caught? No, I think they were just harassing me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, William, why don't you tell us a little bit about this house and its importance and significance in your life in Dorothy? Well, the house we were living in over on Bell Place was only a two-bedroom house, and there were four children and two parents, and it was too small, and so anyway, uh, I had a friend that lived here on Tremont in a two-story house, and his dad and my dad were talking one time, and and his dad told my dad about this house that she could buy for forty-five hundred dollars. That was back in the 1930s. So he decided to buy it, and we were glad, and we moved over here. We thought we was the big shots coming over here in this nice area. <laughs> Grandma, do you remember that? Yes, I do, because I was in the, um, in the third grade, and it was so much fun to come to a new house because we had two bed bathrooms instead of one, and three bath bedrooms, and it was a nice big house, and we had a washroom and dining room and breakfast room, so we thought we were, we, we're very comfortable here. And I had a nice neighborhood and a lot of friends that lived up and down the street. And we were able to walk to school. And um, what else do you remember, Billy? What was it like going to school there? Here. Well, uh, I was in, went to uh, South High Mount and then to uh, Stripling Junior High School is what they call it at that time, and then to Arlington Heights High School. And I was in ROTC, and we run the flag up every morning and salute and say pledge allegiance, and then we the bugle would play reveille, and and then at night we take the flag down and we play taps. And so it was oh, some experience as me. One time my friend and I were in the auditorium and we went back stage there and we saw the steel ladder leading up to, to the top up there and a, a trap door. And we decided, well, let's go up there and check, see what's up there. So, so anyway, Bruce climbed up the steel ladder and he opened that trap door up and, and entered on into the area above the auditorium and I followed right behind him. And there was a, a wooden plank there that you you walked on up there right above the ceiling. And uh, so we looked out there and said, I wonder if we could walk out there. There's some white looking stuff out there. So he took his foot out there and, and this acoustic tile fell off and, and down into the auditorium. There were some people down there, some <laughs> students, and it hit down below and with a big clatter. And they said, there's somebody up there. And we saw the people up there. And, and so we said, oh, we better get out of here. So we beat back to that steel ladder and just and Bruce was in the lead and he just slid down one side of the ladder and I did the same thing 
And so the time we used to go in, somebody's coming back there and they said, there's somebody up there. And we said, oh, there he is. And so it's kind of funny. <laughs> so you never got caught for that we either? We didn't get caught for that, but I'm confessing here on TV now. <laughs> okay. Grandma, what's something you remember that's memorable in your mind about going to grade school or high school? Well, I remember um, one thing, it wasn't particularly about that, but it was about riding downtown. We had the trolley that ran up and down Canterbury Boulevard, and it was on uh, rails. So you just had to go out in the middle of Canterbury and get on the trolley, and it would be downtown in about 15 minutes. And that used to be a fun thing for me to do. And there were three big movies down there that we could go see. And all sorts of department stores, like Leonard's and Mommy's and Stripling's. And we used to go downtown. That was a big thing to go downtown and shop on Sunday and Saturday. And um, then another thing I remembered was that we loved to go down to Will Rogers Auditorium and go ice skating. They had a huge ice skating rink down there. And we used to walk down there on Saturday and spend the whole day and our whole week's allowance skating all day long. And that was a lot of fun too. How much would you say your weekly allowance was? Uh, mine was three dollars. Was that about average, would you say, with your yes, friends? I would say that would be average. Uncle Billy, do you think that you got I a... I don't remember getting an allowance. <laughs> okay, well, what ha What are some things that happened when you were in high school? Did anything memorable, any kind of experiences? Or Well, I remember when I was a senior at Arlington Heights, we won the city championship, and we were all very proud of that, and we used to play uh, football games down at Will Rogers, the, the stadium down there, Farrington Field. And we also used to love to go down to Forest Park and go on picnics. And, and when I was growing up, they had horse, horses down there. So you could go rent a horse and ride around Forest Park. And that was so much fun until the stadium was safe stable burned down one day, and then that was the end of that. Hmm. So we used to go down to the duck pond and have a wonderful time down there. And the zoo, we used to love to go to the zoo and botanic garden. And that was fun. And Billy used to play golf all the time, so he was always in the golf tournament sometimes, weren't you, Billy? Well, uh, we played out at Glen Gordon Country Club, and one time I entered in the tournament, and I ended up in the second flight, and I played this one guy, and, and I shot 79, and beat him, and said, Oh, he shot 79, he shouldn't be in the second flight, my goodness, he's a trophy hunter. <laughs> Yeah. And this, this guy, that he, you asked him, well, how's your business? And he's a undertaker or something. He said, dead as usual. <laughs> dead uh, as usual. Pretty, pretty bad joke, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I won a set of clubs and I won the second flight. That was good, Billy. Yeah. Good job, Uncle Billy. Congratulations. Hallelujah. Okay. Let me say one thing else. Uh, I'm not bragging now because I know we're not supposed to brag, but I just a statement of fact I've had nine hole in one. Thank mm -hmm. you, Lord. <laughs> okay. How old were you during the Depression, Grandma? You were a Depression baby, right? Yes, I was born in 31. And um, I didn't realize it, but my family was very fortunate compared to most families. And we always had plenty of everything, but other people really had problems. And I can remember my mother um, letting people, they would come to the back door and ask for food and work and money and everything. And mother would always 
provide them with whatever she could. She was always really sweet to those people, but there were a lot of people that had very difficult times, and we were just fortunate that we didn't. But then things started improving after, when World War II started, then the economy started improving, and people had jobs because they were all working for the war effort, and everything started booming in Fort Worth, and there were a lot of people that came down from the east and the north to work in the factories down here, making planes and bombs and all that. So we were very fortunate to live in a good area. And then they built Will Rogers Auditorium and um, all the stadium and all of that during World War II, and that was really good for Fort Worth. So we had a wonderful childhood, and we were fortunate to live close to three schools that we could always walk to and everything. And I had one sister that went to TCU, uh, some, and then Billy went to the University of Texas and a and and so did my other brother. So, Billy, um... I majored in mathematics and minored in physics and geology, so I ended up working on a seismograph crew for a while, and then went, I was uh, sent to Las Vegas to help monitor the underground nuclear tests that they had at the, the ball test site about 60 miles northwest of uh, Las Vegas. And then I finally went to Washington, D.C., worked on there, and then they sent me to Boulder, Colorado, and uh, that's where I retired. And then finally moved back here to be with my sister and my nieces in Fort Worth where I grew up. Well, tell them about working for NOAA and monitoring the, the Earth and giving the reports to the airlines and all of them, all that. Well, I was involved in uh, geomagnetism and there's uh, geomagnetic observatories all around the world in different countries and we get all that data and they do a spherical harmonic analysis of the information and come up with a, a series of magnetic charts to show what the value of the detonation and the vertical and horizontal and total intensity of the Earth's magnetic field is at any certain point. So anyway, I get letters from people wanting to know what the magnetic declination was, say, in 1700s. Uh, they were trying to find the treasure and, and they had gone down in a ship off of Florida and, and they wanted to know what the declination was at that, at how much it had changed from that time to the present so they would know how to, to survey to find out where the ship was. Oh, I didn't know they did that. That's good. And then they, we also had programs that uh, we'd send to the airlines that would help them compute the magnetic declination at any point during their flight in the air. And then also in certain areas there'd be what, what you call magnetic anomalies for the intensity of the magnetic field was not what it, you'd think it would be but due to deposits of iron ore in the ground. And the airlines uh, needed to know that information so it would help them not get off track on their flight. Oh, that's interesting, Billy. I didn't know you did all that. That's right. Honest. Sounds like you might be scout. smart. <laughs> <laughs> I take after my Uncle Billy. <laughs> and Uncle Billy, tell us about some of your participation in the war. What you did. 
Well, I was sent to Camp Hood to train in a tank destroyer unit. And after our basic training was over, they uh, told me in Vinya Taurus to either learn how to be a, a pilot or going back to school to study. So I decided to take the, to go back to school and they sent me to the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. And then things were not going too well over in in Europe and they were needing some more troops and they were talking about drafting some more people and said, Why well, you got those guys in school there, send them over there and so anyway, they got they ceased that ASTP program, sent us back to well, sent me to uh, Camp Carson, Colorado, to train in the combat engineers. Seemed like I was getting the toughest com combat training units. Uh, and anyway, so I learned how to be a radio operator and we learned how to build Bailey bridges and so then finally they decided to send us overseas and uh, we landed in Scotland and broke down on a train to England and stayed there in England across from Liverpool for a while and then they sent us to over to France and we landed at La Havre France and when we got there the people were real angry at us for some reason. We didn't know why. Finally the company commander told us well the reason why was because the, we, <coughs> the Air Force thought that the Germans were at La Havre and they bombed the city but the, the Germans had left out the night before and it killed uh, ended up killing some civilians and so they were angry at us because of that. Mm. And then they sent us uh, to, uh, we went to this French castle which is called a Chateau, Chateau. It was three stores high and they had third stores for the servants and we stayed there for a while and in the basement we, we were always looking around and and their wine cellar was completely empty. The Germans had taken everything. So anyway, we were walking in. I looked down to the trap door and down in that, in the ground there was a, a German hand grenade. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it a potato masher type hand grenade. And we'd been trained not to touch anything or, or try to take any thing, you know, it could be a booby trap under it and blow you up. So we told the company commander about it. And then we went to, to Marseille after the war had ended and we were waiting there and the, getting ready to see where to go from there and they dropped the atom bomb on Japan and so we were scheduled to go to Manila and the ship was in the harbor and they had everything set up and so they decided to send us back to the States then since the war in Japan had ended after the atom bomb was dropped. Did you tell them that uh, the Battle of the Bulge was what you were headed for when your ship broke down and you, by the time you, um, they got it repaired when the Battle of the Bulge was over and that was the worst battle almost of World War II. That was when so many people got killed. And Billy barely missed being right in the middle of it. Well, they changed our orders in the middle of the trip over, over to England. They changed it to be in the combat engineers to be in a special service engineer regiment. 390, 393rd Special Service Engineer Regiment. We built roads and breathing huts and things like that. So we 
were spared any combat, although I did was awarded a couple of uh, combat stars. Anytime you get within 50 miles of combat, they give you a battle star. But I never did actually uh, engage in combat. But we have a first cousin who was right in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge. And it just so happened that our aunt had a premonition one night that she should send him a white sheet. Um, for some reason, she didn't know why. So she sent him this white sheet, and um, that is what saved his life because it was snowing, and he covered himself up with that white sheet, and he didn't get sh he got wounded, but he didn't get killed. And the rest of the guys didn't have any way to protect themselves. They were just op out there in the open field. All right, William. What did you do um, following your return to Texas after the war? Well, I decided to go to the University of Texas, and and uh, that's where I came qualified to be a geophysicist for the government. And I ended up going to um, Rockville, Maryland to work at the Science Center there. And then uh, before that, though, here in Fort Worth, I, well, after I worked for a sonograph crew for a while, I, I quit and then came back here and uh, I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost at Northside Assembly of God. Then I decided to go out and do evangelistic work and, and I left here with 50 cents in my pocket and a, a jacket and, and a black bag with some things in it, my Bible, and hitchhiked and this guy let me off in Oklahoma City at 12 o'clock midnight in the worst part of town. And I didn't know where to go. And here comes the squad car. And they stopped and said, What are you doing down here in this part of town? Don't you know you get killed? And I said, Well, I got a, I was hitchhiking this guy let me off here. And I'm an evangelist. And and they said, what do you got in that black bag? And I said, well, I got my Bible and some other things. And they said, open it up. So I zipped it open down. Yeah, there's the Bible and all. So they said, well, get in the car. Get in the squad car. So I got in the back seat. And there's a, a lieutenant, I think, and another patrolman. And so I asked them if they were Christians, and, and this lieutenant said he was, and this other guy didn't hardly, he didn't, wouldn't hardly answer. And so they said, well, do you have any money on you? And I think you're supposed to have a dollar, or you'd be considered a vagrant. So I didn't have that. So this lieutenant gave me a dollar. <laughs> and, So anyway, he, they took me to this mission downtown on Skid Row there in Oklahoma City. And they, this lieutenant knocked on the door. This guy came to the door and he talked to him. So they let me come in the mission and, and stay in there. And I ended up staying there at that mission and doing missionary work. I went along uh, with the alcoholics and, and doing what I could to help them out. Well, that was good of you, Billy. Well, Dorothy, uh, yes. why don't you tell us a little bit about the effect that the war had on you and the war effort at home, what that was like. Okay, well, um, I was a young child growing up, and uh, 
all of us were trying to figure out a way that we could help out with the war effort because we were really too young to do anything. So my little next door neighbor decided that a good thing for us to do would be to start um, collecting scrap metal. So we got all the scrap metal from all of this area that we could find and we piled it up in a neat little pile out in the front and um, that's one way that we helped. But when uh, we used to have air raid um, protection and we would have to turn out all the lights and it was always really dark because we couldn't have a light shining because we didn't know whether we were going to be bombed or not. And so we had to have these fire, fire these drills, these raids, these, um, to protect ourselves in case we did get bombed. And um, we had some interesting things happen. They sunk a submarine down in Galveston, and some of the parts of the submarine washed up on the shore down there, and everyone was pretty scared about that. And my mother had this dream that we were invaded by the Japanese, and that we were put in a prison camp, and she was hysterical over that. And she was upset because in that day and time, um, the Army wouldn't let the soldiers tell where they were or what they were doing. So Mother didn't know where her two sons were. And she knew that some of their friends that they went to high school with were being killed and everything, and she, but she didn't know where they were. And occasionally we'd get these little um, letters in the mail but it would never give where they were or the battle they were in or anything like that. So it was all very secretive. One time my mother lost the shoe stamp that she, you had to have to buy shoes. So um, I had to go to shoot the school that year with canvas shoes on my feet. And that was very upsetting to me. <laughs> we also had to um, have stamps for uh, meat and other things, buy stuff. You know, we just had so many stamps we could use. And so we had to be real careful, and gasoline was rationed. And we could just, we were just allowed so many gallons of gas a month. And my dad had a new car with four new tires on it, and he made the mistake of parking it out in front and you couldn't get tired anywhere. So the next morning he went out to get in his car and all four tires had been stolen. Oh, and he was so upset about that. Mm. But, you know, it was kind of hard. And my sister was in Washington, D.C. working for the government. And we went up there to see her for oh, a couple of weeks before Christmas. And that was my first experience with going to Washington, D.C., and that was quite an adventure. And, you know, part of that was fun, but we had good and bad times. It was a stressful time for all of us because we never knew what was going to happen anymore or what we were going to have to go through. Because we heard a lot of horror stories about things that were going on everywhere. But fortunately enough, we won. Yay! <laughs> so everything was okay. <laughs> so we basically had a very good childhood, and we were very, very fortunate. Would you agree with that, Uncle Billy? Yeah, I'd agree with that. We were blessed by uh, the Creator, and He spared our lives. And He still blesses us, gives us faith walk in love and peace and joy. That's true. And now I have a precious little Courtney, my granddaughter, that I dearly love. And I'm so glad that I get to spend time with her and have so much fun. Because she always includes me in everything. <laughs> and she's a real good director of movies. And she deserves an A. A plus. <laughs> oh, at least. <laughs> okay. Now, Grandma, earlier you were talking.
talking about how you would go to the movie theater. What were some of the different movies you would see, and how do you think those movies and music influenced your life? And Uncle Billy, what were some of the things that you remember about the movies and music of that time? Well, Gone with the Wind was one of the most exciting movies I have ever seen. And I remember seeing it the first time it was shown in Fort Worth, Texas, and I was so thrilled with it. And then another movie that I thought was just so wonderful was The Wizard of Oz. And to my mind, those were two of the greatest movies that were ever made. And I think they still say that. Well, when I was a small kid, uh, my mother took me to a movie, and it was a uh, Harold Lloyd movie, and it showed him up on a real tall building, and he was walking along the edge of this building, and he was like, he was waving around like he's going to fall off, and it, so I hid underneath the chair there in the movie. I don't know what happened. <laughs> what about the music of that time? What do you remember about that? Well, I remember the Tuxedo Junction and Stardust was, was my favorite, I guess. And there's just a lot of fun. Uh, music to dance with by uh, Bob Wills used, and his band used to play in the Panther City Hall down in the middle of Fort Worth. And so my wife and I went down there to see it and we decided to, to buy a Bible. So, we bought him a little white Bible and took it up there to him. And, and he knew my wife's brother and all. And, and he said, he thanked us for it and all. And he said that actually he felt like he'd been called to be a preacher, been a call to preacher. But he never did really fulfill that calling. But he, he did a lot of things that were I help people out and all. And I liked his music. What kind of music was it? Well, it was kind of a western style music. Okay. Well, I trust old boys from the field in the hill. And he had some guy that he got Oh, oh. <laughs> They were really popular too. Yeah, he, I heard that he made three fortunes and then some of them lost, lost all. I don't know how he ended up, but he probably was too well. And what did you say his name was again? Bob Will. Oh. Did you ever hear him? No. No. I've never heard of Bob Will. I think that was for Courtney's time. But he's on my review for my next test. Is he? He's a person I need to know. Oh my goodness. That's so now good. I know. That's good. Okay. Now what? <laughs> Is there any other things about the music or movies that influence anything? Grandma, do you have anything to add? I can't think of anything. Those are the two outstanding movies that I can think of. Of course, we had Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire and all sorts of wonderful actors and actresses, and we always enjoyed their performances because they had these elaborate, elaborate uh, dance things, and it was very romantic, and it was just so much fun to go to the movies. That was our big thing to go to the movies. Whenever I was in high school in ROTC, we had an ROTC dance, and 
and I had a date with uh, what was going to be later on a movie star. Her name was Martha Hire, and she and I double dated with friends there, and we were coming home from the dance, and the street was misty and kind of slippery and all, and Mark and I were in the back seat, and, and Bill, and what, what was the name of the other one? Up Betty Joe Zachary. Betty Joe Zachary were in the front seat, and, and Betty Joe said, oh, look, my car side is welcome. He looked, he turned his head to look, and at the same time he turned the wheel a little bit, and, and Martha saw he, what he heading right for a telephone pole. He said, look out, Bill. And so he turned back, but he went in the skid right into that telephone pole. And Betty Joe's face went through the windshield, lacerated her face, and I remember it left a little lock of hair up there in the, wind, in the windshield. And Martha had hurt her knee real bad and hit, hit her her lips and were bleeding and hit it on the seat and, uh, and one of our friends in high school came along and, and gave first aid to Betty Joe and also to Martha and, and I hit the seat in front of her and I fell on the floor, hurt my left knee a little bit and uh, the driver hit the wind, the uh, steering wheel with his chest and hurt him a little bit. But the men didn't get hurt here as much as the women, and uh, because it was on the right side where it happened. So anyway, Martha later on came, uh, ended up being a, a movie star and playing a, a lot of good movies with Bob Wolf and some others. And so that's uh, something that happened. How about you, Well, Uncle Billy, anything else you want to add, or Grandma? I can't think of anything. All right, well. It seemed like there was something else. What? Well, uh, whenever I came back here to Fort Worth, I, I was introduced to this this little eight-year-old girl. I think it's eight-year-old. Her name was Cordy Denny. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's the, one of the big stars in our life now. Yeah, they've been buddies ever since. <laughs> Okay. Don't you think you all say something for me? Well, star. I'm not the star. This interview is about you. Okay. Well, I guess this concludes our interview. And we will leave. Uncle Billy, did you want to end with a song? Oh, yeah. Okay. We'll end with a song for you. Radio Star.
Hello, 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 hello,